Good morning and welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture for our final program of this fall. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Barbara Armacost to introduce her. Uh, one of our former students will come up in a moment, but I want to give you a couple of quick announcements if you want to spend any time with Professor Armacost, we're going to go after this lecture to the Tadlock House for coffee. You're very welcome to come over and spend some time there in conversation. And she'll speak again tonight at seven o'clock at Central Presbyterian Church downtown. The, uh, the joy of introductions is one that I, I pass, I do a lot myself. I like to introduce speakers because I get to know their work and then it gives me a chance to interact with them a little bit. But the reason that we have Professor Armacost today is our own graduate, Amanda Cusick. Amanda graduated from King in 2019-ish uh, and, uh, and proceeded to go to the University of Virginia for law school. And it's on her recommendation that we have Professor Armacost today. Uh, Amanda, among other things, was a student lecturer here. Uh, she was the recipient of our RTL Liston Award. And most significantly, she was a teaching assistant for the Department of History and Political Science, which is the, the pinnacle of achievement. So I'm going to ask Amanda to come and introduce Professor Armacost. Good morning. Uh, it is the pleasure I have to introduce Professor Armacost this morning. Um, she sort of had three careers in one. Uh, she went to nursing school at UVA and spent several years as a nurse first, and then earned a master's in Christian studies from Regent in Vancouver before she went back to UVA for law school. As a student, she was the notes editor of the Law Review, and she won several awards, but the one I'll mention is the Ritter, which is essentially an award for character and integrity. After law school, she clerked on the Fourth Circuit and worked at the Department of Justice before returning to UVA to teach. At the law school, she teaches torts, criminal procedure, and religious liberty, among other things, which has led to a body of scholarship that considers those areas of the law with a particular interest in how they interact with Christian theology, which I think you'll hear more about from her this morning. Martin reached out to me uh, last year to ask if I'd run into anyone at UVA who would be a good fit to come speak in this series. And from everything I just said about Professor Armacost, it's probably already apparent why I put him in touch with her. Um, but the reason she was the first person who came to mind when he asked really wasn't because of who she is on paper. I had this sort of crisis of my faith in law school. I say I had one, I guess I'm still having one. Um, I was sad and angry with the church and just unsure that this faith was for me anymore. And she had me over for coffee at her house and I don't remember what I said or what she said, um, but she noticed that I was really struggling. And she asked me to church with her and I said no. <laughs> Um, so she had coffee with me every Wednesday for, I think, two years so that I would have some sort of fellowship while I wasn't in church. Um, and I say all of that to say Professor Armacost is a super accomplished lawyer and professor, and the nature of her work absolutely makes her a good fit to speak in this series. Um, but the reason I put her in touch with Martin is less about who she is in that way and more about who she's been to me in practice. So please welcome Barbara Armacost. So is this on already? Can you turn it on for me? We're good? All right. You can hear me now? All right. So I want to say thank you to Martin Dodderweik for inviting me to come. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and I'm also thankful to the King Institute for Faith and Culture for um, its sponsorship of these uh, invocations. Um, I hope I'll have a chance to meet some of you at the reception after this, uh, these remarks. Thank you so much, Amanda. Amanda was a real highlight, uh, student highlight for me over the time she was at UVA. So I've had a chance to walk through your beautiful campus, which has really been nice. I hope I'll have a chance to walk a little bit through it a little bit more. I understand that you guys, Bristol, is the birthplace of country music. That was news to me, right? I had actually never really heard that much of Bristol except from Amanda. Um, I'm hoping, hoping to go to the museum while I'm here. I also understand that you've got a NASCAR racetrack here. So like, yeah, so I don't know. Did any of you come to, uh, to, come to school here because you wanted to study about 
racing, right? Anyway, I think I'll pass. So I also took a look at the website of King University to see if I could get an idea what your education here might look like. And one phrase from the web page of the King Institute for Faith and Culture caught my eye. It reads, the ground where faith and culture intersect is rich with opportunity. Seeds planted here bear fruit for generations. I love that quote because part of our task as Christ followers is precisely to find the place where our God-given talents intersect with the needs of the world. I pray that the things I say today will be food for thought on your journey through the places where faith and, inter faith and culture intersect in your life. So I'm afraid my topic today, the topic of racism and policing, is a difficult one. If you've been following the news, you've heard a lot about policing these days, and much of it is not positive. You've heard about traffic stops that ended with police shooting the suspect. You've heard about police executing a no-knock warrant that ended up in the death of an innocent resident. You've heard a litany of the names of men and women, Tamir Rice, Laquan McDonald, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Philando Castillo, Brianna Taylor, who've been shot or killed by police, most of them black and unarmed. You may have seen a video of a circle of officers restraining and kneeling on George Floyd until he suffocated to death. You've likely seen protests in the streets and calls for actions as drastic as defunding the police entirely. These are the issues my students and I discuss in the classes I teach at the UVA School of Law. We examine the legal regulation of police officers and police departments. We discuss the Fourth Amendment rules that govern police searches, seizures, and uses of force. We explore, explore Fifth Amendment rules surrounding police interrogation of suspects. Amanda studied these topics with me. And what I've seen over the years um, in attending to these topics, that a majority of officers are doing a good job and working hard to avoid harming people. I want to be very clear about that point. But it's also the case that an alarming number of police officers are not doing their job well and are harming people and racial minorities are particularly at risk from police misconduct. My teaching and research focus on these issues and how to reform the police departments that produce bad cops. In short, I'm interested in the vocation of policing from every angle, including, and importantly, what the Bible has to say about it. As Christ followers, we turn to the scriptures for wisdom about every vocation. As students of King University, I'm guessing that you guys are familiar with the idea that whatever vocation we find ourselves in, whether medicine or social work or music or education or politics, God has weighed in on it. If you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, that's okay too. I hope you won't tune out. I hope I can show you that a smart, thoughtful person can find wisdom and meaning in a Christian view of the world. So I'd like to share some thoughts with you about the vocation of law enforcement. God has much to say about this particular vocation because he cares passionately for our communities to be marked by justice. Perhaps not many of you are going to end up in a criminal justice or law enforcement or legal career, but all of us as Christians must care about justice. And I'm also hoping that my thinking with you about policing can serve as a template for your reflections on your own vocation and about other hard cultural questions. In developing the beginnings of a Christian theology of policing, I'm going to focus my attention on Romans 13, 1 to 4. These are the go-to verses for the current predominant Christian theology of law enforcement. You may be familiar with this text, which appears on the slide behind me. I want to make three points about this passage and its application to law enforcement. You'll see them reflected in order in the verses you can see on the screen. First, in formulating their view of policing, some Christians now and throughout history have bought into a wrong interpretation of Romans 13. This wrong interpretation has tragically led to a distorted view of policing. It has also led, resulted in support for unjust and even evil policies and regimes. Second, in framing a biblical view of policing, 
It's really important to reckon with the racist history of American policing. What many people do not realize, including many Christians, is that the first modern police departments in this country were the slave patrols of the pre-emancipation South. Third, we need a corrected reading of Romans 13, one that takes account of its place within the broader context of biblical teachings on restorative justice. Many interpretations of Romans 13 have viewed God's justice as only retributive, only about punishment, which has led to a distorted and unbiblical view of American policing. I'll end with some do's and don'ts for us as we seek to affirm the important vocation of law enforcement. For third th the first thing we must reckon with is the tragic reality that Romans 13 has been misinterpreted and misused by Christians in many different eras right up to our own times. This is a distressing part of history, but one we have to face if we're not gonna continue repeating our errors. Romans 13 has been twisted and used as a proof text to support patently unjust regimes and policies. For example, when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850, requiring all good citizens to aid in capturing and returning, returning escaped slaves, defenders of the slave system cited Romans 13 too. They accused abolitionists of rebelling against God by not following the new law. Rome, Germans who obeyed the anti-Jewish Nuremberg laws defended their actions by saying they had just followed the law. We can never forget, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal, and it was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. When evangelical activist Michael Cassidy met with then President Botha in, 1880, in 1985 to protest the immorality of apartheid, Botha quoted him Romans 13, 1 and 2. As Cassidy later recalled, Botha, quote, apparently imagined that the passage was enough to justify unequivocal, uh, unequivocal support of the nationalist government's apartheid policy. And such misuses of Romans 13 are not just actions in the past, they continue in the present. In a, 19, in a 2018 speech to law enforcement officers in Fort Wayne, Indiana, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions invoked Romans, Romans 13, 1 and 2. Sessions was defending the administration's policy of separating migrant children from their parents at the U.S. border. He said, quote, I will cite you the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained the government for his purposes. How is it that some Christians have ended up supporting the enforcement of such brutal regimes and practices? Obviously, the reasons are many and complex, and we can't get to all of them. But the misuse of Romans 13 is a key one. Evangelical pastors, Christian policing ministries, and police officers themselves have fastened on Romans 13, 1 to 4 as a way to understand the vocation of law enforcement. The primary verses, as you can see behind me, read, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is re rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do will bring judgment on themselves. If you do wrong, be afraid, for the official does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. As applied to law enforcement, three conclusions have been drawn from these verses. The first claim is that human government including the institution of policing, has been ordained by God to enforce law and order. Now this claim fits squarely with truths about God's preserving work in a broken world. The ruling authorities are in place because God is not going to allow chaos to reign in the world. While we'll never have perfect justice in this world, God desires that there should be a measure of justice and order, and he uses human government for that purpose. This point is made three-dimensional when our houses are burgled or someone is assaulted or our bag is stolen. Then we want someone to be in authority. No one wants to live in a world where wrongdoers can do harm without consequence. 
Also, I think about situations where police and judges are not doing their job to keep order. Before too long, vigilante groups and mobs and individuals take justice into their own hands. The context surrounding Romans 13 tells us that the government is in place precisely to replace personal vengeance with the governmental system for dispensing justice. According to Romans 12, verse 19, Christ's followers are not to retaliate against, who, against those who do them harm. It says, quote, do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Eight verses later, we are reassured that wrongdoers will not go unpunished. Governmental officials, presumably lawyers and judges, are empowered to execute the justice that is forbidden to individuals. The second claim made in Romans 13, that anyone who disobeys the law or rebels against governmental authority is rebelling against God himself. When this claim is combined with claim one, that government is God ordained to punish wrongdoing, we find ourselves in trouble. We know from all kinds of historical examples that I've already referenced that human governments are often not good. Some are abusive, unjust, authoritarian, or corrupt. Are even these evil governments ordained, ordained by God? Are we rebelling against God if we call out or resist unjust laws or rulers? Or are we justified to resist immoral laws to seek, seek justice? I will have more to say in response to this question in a few minutes. But for now, let me say that Romans 13, read in the broader context of the whole of Scripture, makes one thing very clear. Got calls for governmental adherence to law and order cannot ultimately trump God's command to do justice. Moving on then, what about claim three? That police officers are agents of God's wrath against those who do wrong. This passage has led evangelical pastors and leading leaders of policing ministries to call police officers God's warriors. And police officers themselves have sometimes adopted this self-identifying language. In some policing conferences, police officers told, are told that they, quote, that their work, quote, is part of God's victory against the forces of darkness. And police-themed Bibles include devotional materials that call Jesus the most pro-cop person in the universe. For, some of, for any of you who have studied criminal justice, you will know there's a fundamental legal problem with calling police officers God's warriors who dispense God's wrath on evildoers. In our judicial system, it is not police officers who dispense punishment, dispense punishment on wrongdoers. Police investigate crimes, they arrest people, they search houses, and they interrogate witnesses. But none of this conduct is remotely about punishment. All the people police interact with are innocent until they are proven guilty in a court of law. So the whole notion that law enforcement officers are carrying out the wrath of God is misguided from the start. In addition, the militaristic and violent flavor of language like God's warriors cannot help but affect both how police officers view their vocation and how Christ followers expect them to behave. The idea that God's wrath that, that police stops and arrests and their use of force involve the execution of God's wrath fundamentally changes the meaning of these actions. This kind of language may not be intended to glorify violence, but calling police God's warriors seems to assume that violent force by police is not only to be expected, but it is itself ordained by God. When wrath of God language is used to justify police actions, it lands with particular force on black and brown communities. When a police training in his town used Romans 13 language, a local black pastor had this to say. Given the long nightmarish history that black people have with police departments, it's a very scary prospect to have a Bible verse describing the police force as the wrath of God to carry out justice on evildoers. The pastor worried that using Romans 13 to train police was weaponizing scripture to justify violence. In a few minutes, I'll turn to a very different theology of policing that is derived from a properly contextual reading of Romans 13. Before I do that, though, 
we must consider, we must briefly consider the history of American policing, which is, sadly, a racist history. We need to understand this history because any adequate biblical theology of law enforcement cannot treat the subject in the abstract. We have to deal with the historical contours of policing in America and its particular shortcomings. Only then can we find our path back to the necessary theology that will lead us toward a racially just American policing institution. Many police scholars trace American policing back to police organizations in New York City, Boston, and Philadelphia in the 1840s and 1850s. These northern departments were modeled after the English Metropolitan Police, which was founded in 1829. But by the time policing was for formalized in the north, southern policing already had a long and distinct history. The very first modern police departments in America were the slave patrols of the antebellum south. The slave patrols were created in large part to enforce the slave codes, a detailed list of criminal violations designed to preserve the, preserve the mechanisms of slavery. Among other provisions, the slave codes made black slaves and their offspring slaves for life. The first slave codes were enacted by colonial and later state legislatures in Maryland and Virginia in the 1660s, but soon after, black codes existed all across the South. Beginning in the 1690s, slave patrols were established in South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, Georgia, and Mississippi. Patrol members traveled town and countryside, finding runaway slaves and returning them to their masters. Patrol members ruled with violence and brutality when tracking escaped slaves. Their tactics were intentionally harsh, producing a level of terror designed to deter slave revolts. By 1837, the largest law enforcement organization in America was the 100-person slave patrol in Charleston, South Carolina. Slave patrols in Richmond, Raleigh, Charleston, and New Orleans also eventually evolved into permanent police forces. The slave patrol origins of Southern policing left an indelible mark on the culture of law enforcement. As police historians Robert Wadman and William Allison have framed it, the brutal nature of slave patrols against blacks and the assumption that all blacks off their owner's property were up to no good directly influenced the behavior of Southern police departments, many of which were organized during the time of the slave patrols. The violent racism of slave patrols and the separate and unequal treatment of blacks through slave codes became institutionalized in Southern policing. During Reconstruction, former members of the Confederate Army filled the leadership ranks of reorganized Southern police departments. They brought with them their pre-war values of white superiority and racism, which in turn perpetuated institutional racism in Southern police organizations. The Reconstruction era saw unparalleled violence against blacks by gangs, such as the Ku Klux Klan, while police stood by or participated in the violence. During this period, police officers became the de facto upholders of white supremacy in their communities. During the so-called Jim Crow era of the late 19th and early 20th century, Southern police departments were, enfor were enforced state and local laws demanding segregation in workplaces, occupational choices, housing, traveling, and voting. Law professor Richard Epstein calls the Jim Crow era a period of excessive state power when law enforcement came to be construed both generally and in race relations as the ability to regulate virtually anything that was deemed to affect safety, health, morals, or general welfare. Although formal policing in the North was not in place until the 1850s, its origin also reflect a racial and ethnic impetus. In the mid-19th century, northern cities such as New York and Philadelphia had seen a dramatic rise in population, fueled in large part by an influx of thousands of immigrants from abroad. These waves of immigration led to considerable levels of ethnic a conflict in these cities. Prejudices over foreign bird immigrants and people of African descent spilled over into violent upheavals. Anti-Catholic sentiments resulted in riots that destroyed churches and convents. 
Sociologists Craig Brown and Barbara Warner argue that the increasing numbers of immigrants cause native-born Americans to put pressure on police to clamp down on urban crime, especially crime related to undesirable aspects of the foreign community's lifestyle. Unfortunately, the racist history of American policing I've just recounted is reflected in some current police practices that have led to multiple lawsuits alleging racial discrimination. This historical story also helps to explain the striking difference between the way white communities and black communities view law enforcement. Polling by the Public Religion Research Institute has shown that whereas 82% of white American evangelicals and white Roman Catholics trust police to do what is right, either just about always or most of the time, only 32% of black Christians trust the police. This dramatic difference is easily illustrated in ordinary life. When I, as a white woman, am pulled over by police, I may be worried that I'll get a ticket, but I do not fear for my life and my bodily security. Contrast my experience to that of Dr. Esau McCulley, a black professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, and I understand he came and spoke to you last week. He says, my hope for policing is not that complicated. I want to live free of fear. When I am pulled over for a traffic stop, I am afraid, precisely because the police have been a source of terror in my life, my ancestors' lives, and the lives of my people. The view, this view of law, the view of law enforcement described by Dr. McCulley describes a legacy of fear that has been passed down through generations of black families. It stretches back from modern policing, back through the civil rights era, the Jim Crow South, and all the way back to slave patrols of the antebellum period. A robust theology of American policing must grapple with the implications of these historical realities. We cannot hope to understand what a God-directed policing might look like unless we take stock of how policing got to its current state and what theological errors might have contributed to where we are today. A third and final thing we need to do in order to formulate a robust Christian view of law enforcement is to uncover a more theologically correct reading of Romans 13. Placing Romans 13 in a broader biblical and theological context will reveal that the reading we discussed earlier reflects a too narrow view of the scriptural meaning of justice. In this last section of my remarks, I'll make two key points about the biblical conception of God's justice. First, God's justice is not simply a call for law and order. And second, God's justice is restorative as well as punitive. In our quest for a contextual and theological correct reading of Romans 13, we must first recognize that the call for law and order can never trump God's passion for justice. Here, Martin Luther King Jr. offers us a critical lesson. In 1963, King had been imprisoned following peaceful protests in Birmingham. Eight white members of the local clergy published open letters to the citizens of Alabama and to King himself, urging them not to join the street protests in Birmingham. The pastors wrote, when rights are constantly denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe principles of law and order and common sense. King responded, by chiding his fellow clergy for being more concerned about law and order than with the demands of God's justice. In his letter from Birmingham jail, King wrote, you express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern, but there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation laws are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. So segregation is not only politically 
economically and sociologically unsound, but it is morally wrong and sinful. King also reprimanded the letter writers for commending the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. This alleged law and order involved the use of vicious dogs who mauled protesters, inhumane treatment of black arrestees, and pushing, cursing, slapping, and kicking protesters, including children. King chided the white pastors for denouncing the demonstrations, but not expressing a similar concern for the ugly history of racial injustice, police brutality, and unsolved bombings that had brought the demonstrators into the streets. The episode I've just described is only one of the many historical instances in which Romans 13 has been twisted to support immoral rulers and evil governments and to repel those who resist. These invocations of Romans 13 highlight an exegetical error in some Christians' application of this passage, namely, the failure to understand its teaching in light of the Bible's broader teaching around justice. When that wider context is taken into account, we realize that Romans 13 cannot be demanding unqualified obedience to every human governing authority. A full description of the robust concept of biblical justice is beyond the scope of these remarks, but suffice to say that it provides multiple themes by which to judge human governments. One thing we know for sure, Christ followers must obey God, not human rulers, when the two conflict. In both his writings and his conduct, Paul, the author of the book of Romans, makes clear that the power of the state ends where, where it requires disobedience to God. Paul, as well as Peter and the other disciples, endured relentless, sometimes violent persecution from the authorities because they refused to stop preaching about Jesus. These New Testament believers were carrying on a long tradition of civil disobedience. Jewish history is rife with accounts of God's people disobeying the law in order to obey God. To name only the most famous examples, the Hebrew midwives in Egypt disobeyed Pharaoh's order to kill all Jewish male babies. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace for disobeying King Nebuchadnezzar's order to bow down before a golden image the king had made. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den for disobeying King Darius's order that no one could pray to any god but him. The broader biblical context teaches us that the respect and submission that a Christian owns the state, owes the state is never absolute. In general, Christians should submit to the civil authorities as God ordained, but they have a correlative obligation to speak out when the state uses its power to act violently or unjustly toward one or more of God's image bearers. In addition to equating law and order with justice, a second problem with the predominant Christian view of policing is that it fastens on punishment or retribution as God's final word about wrongdoers. Punishment of wrong is a key feature of Romans 13, but it's hardly the only tenet in an accurate theology of biblical justice. Using Romans 13 as a proof text without paying attention to context elevates a retributive model of justice above the Bible's clear emphasis on restorative justice. While the theme of retribution does appear in the Bible, punishment was never, as it often is for us, the end of justice. Retribution always occurred in the context of community. It always kept open the possibility of eventual reconciliation and restoration, rather than perpetual alienation. While God is sometimes described in human terms as angry or full of wrath, and he's sometimes described as um, pun he, and he's sometimes understood to punish. He is also described as slow to anger and overflowing with loving kindness. As illustrated by his dealings with the nation of Israel, God moves through wrath to restoration. He continually assures his people that he will never give up on them. What are the implications of viewing police as agents of merely retributive justice? as a narrow reading of Romans 13 would suggest, rather than as agents of restorative justice. A retributive reading of Romans 13 sorts people into two categories, the good law followers and the bad lawbreakers. The only thing we know about this second group 
is they violated the law, and the only thing they deserve is punishment. But scripture tells us that there's something much more fundamental that unites the two groups. Both are made in the image of God. The fact that persons have done wrong does not change that fundamental truth that they each have creator God's image stamped on them. This gives them inherent value, dignity, and worth. Indeed, the most profound truth of the Christian faith is that Jesus Christ died for unworthy, law-breaking human beings in order to restore them to fellowship with God. In God's economy, there are not two categories of human beings, lawbreakers and law abiders. There's only one category, sinful, broken human beings saved by grace. The notion that lawbreakers, those who are being policed, are somehow other has permeated Americans and sometimes Christians' responses to law enforcement actions. And throughout our history, this othering has often been tinged with racial overtones. For example, illegal immigrants become rapists, murderers, or drug dealers. They are criminals who threaten American neighborhoods and steal American jobs. Undocumented immigrants are called simply illegals, as if being undocumented is their only identity, which ignores their humanity. In the 1990s, Black youths who were alleged to have committed crimes became known by the racist troop, trope, super predators, a moniker that was exploited by politicians and the media and harmed a generation of black youths. When law enforcement officials assume that the most fundamental truth about certain groups of people is that they are lawbreakers, they begin to treat them as alien to the community rather than God's image bearers with inherent worth and dignity. It is then a short step from categorizing, to disrespecting, to mistreating, to brutalizing. A robust Christian theology of policing rejects these categorizations. Instead, it embraces the image of God in both the police and those they are policing. Let me end with two concluding thoughts, one about the vocation of policing and one about using scripture to inform your thinking about your own vocation and about difficult and complex public issues. First, a comment about the vocation of law enforcement. A truly biblical view of policing will require both a new theology and new practices, and the two are intertwined. Our theology influences not only the way we think about complicated issues, it also affects how we respond in the world in which we find ourselves. So our theology of policing or our theology of any vocation for that matter, must be a lived theology, not an ivory tower theology. And it must take account of history and social structures as well as individual conduct. Police officers do have an important place in God's kingdom work. But it is a calling not to the heroic deeds of the warrior, but to the heroic virtue of a servant. Under a theology of policing, Reflecting God's restorative justice, police officers are God's servants to provide security from harm, freedom from fear, peace in communities, protection for the vulnerable, and equal treatment for all human beings made in God's image. And for the hard and stressful work this requires, they deserve our support. Policing would look very different if police officers thought of themselves as heroic servants rather than as warriors. Second, a concluding thought about reading scripture well. When you seek to apply scripture to your vocation or to hard cultural issues, make sure to consider both its immediate context and the broader context of the whole of scripture. Be careful not to use Bible passages as proof text to support simplistic conclusions or predetermined policy judgments. And don't be sucked in by people who use the Bible that way. Thanks so much for listening. I hope my remarks have provoked your thinking about the vocation of policing. I also hope that my analysis has provided a bit of a template for applying scripture to other hard issues. You have good resources here at King University for thinking about these things. Do take advantage of them while you're here. And for those of you who've been listening well, but who do not describe yourself as Christ followers, I hope I've given you food for thought in your own spiritual journey. May all of you be blessed with energy, 
wisdom, discernment, and hope as you continue your education and explore what it means to pursue God's kingdom work. Thank you very much.